Welcome to my channel. My name is Dr. Rachel Tapman, and my channel is for anybody who cares about language technology and other people. Uh, welcome to today's coffee chat. I got my coffee. Also, hmm, uh, I think it's reflecting some of the green behind me. Um, it literally just occurred to me that my little intro title screen should say something like grabbing coffee or like go get your coffee or something like coffee themed, but it doesn't. Oh, well. Um, Let's hop right in. So today we're going to be talking about uh, a lot of stuff. This one's a little bit more focused on practical things. Um, not quite as much research, not quite as much uh, politics or ethics stuff. So, but as always, it's gonna be organized the same way. We'll start with some research and then we'll talk about, you know, practical stuff, news stories. Uh, hey Dana, welcome. Uh, and then we're going to talk about politics. There's some big court cases uh, this week or things that are relevant to court cases this week in particular. Uh, and then a little bit of ethics and then we'll end with just some like fun stuff to, to go out on a, uh, on a bright note for your, your day or I guess evening. Uh, I know some of you, uh, it is quite late at night. Let's hop right in. So this first uh, paper is a preprint. I don't believe it's been published. I don't know that it's been, um, um, even necessarily submitted for review, but it came across my um, research paper recommendations, I guess. Uh, and the the point of this is to uh, do improve subgroup robustness, right? So if you have like a collection of data and there is some sort of internal grouping, in. I was like, do I have a hair sticking straight up? I sure do. It's from my bun. Uh, I got a haircut, not that you can tell. Uh, and I've got those, those ends that go boop, boop. Um, Right, so if you have a group of data and in that group are reflections of subgroup differences, so for language data, we might think about dialects. Um, in their example here, we've got different types of four-legged animals um, doing including learned slash engineered neural features to do clustering of that group uh, and then using that to improve system robustness. Um, and I think this is a, uh, and you can see, sort of looking at their little, little example here, um, Hey, Robbie, welcome, welcome. Uh, that uh, they added this sort of cluster uh, that created the groups. Um, Sorry, that pause was me trying to figure out if the groups are emergent or uh, provided ahead of time. I think they are emergent. Um, so I think that they are uh, unsupervised clusters. Uh, and uh, then training the, uh, the model on that. And the, the sort of idea there is that you get improved performance uh, within each of the groups because you have this additional information. And this is pretty much exactly what I recommended doing in my dissertation. Um, I think it's a good approach. It's nice to see a sort of computer vision implementation of it. Um, the one thing that I would be like a little bit like mm, on is that, uh, especially if you're working with language data to avoid trying to build, um, you know, a predictor of social group membership. Um, but as long as you're, you're not explicitly trying to build like, 
many of the things that people have tried to build <laughs> with, uh, with models where you're trying to identify group membership in a way that could harm participants um, or data donors or users or people in the world upon whom the system is being used, then I think it's perfectly fine. So, uh, and this paper is, I don't think I actually ever said the title aloud for those of you who are listening, Take One Gram of Neural Features, Get Enhanced Group Robustness, and it is by uh, Simon Bobery, probably, uh, and co-authors uh, out of the uh, Ecole de Pointe and the National Conservatory of Arts and Engineering. I think that's how I engineer. My French is rusty, y'all. <laughs> uh, and VLO.ai. So interesting paper. Um, it's on archive. Uh, like I said, I don't think it's been peer reviewed, but uh, just sort of an interesting approach. Next up. Uh, and this is a popular science article of a, um, a sort of a research program that I am not that familiar with. Like I am not qualified to peer review this, uh, but I saw it. I think, I think Talia Ringer um, posted about it. They posted about it on Twitter. Uh, and I was like, that's so cool. Uh, and basically what it is, it's um, they're using uh, sound waves uh, on a, a metal plate and using that to do MNIST, right? Um, so they had a little, a nice little uh, infographic down here. Um, so basically, um, you, you know, <laughs> you do the basic MNIST image processing. I'm sure many of you have done that step before. Uh, and then that sort of pixel representation is being you is being translated into a sound wave. So, um, you know, pressure compression sort of thing. Um, and then uh, a second sound wave is also created from a list of parameters. Uh, and then they are, you know, allowed to interfere with each other as sound waves do. Uh, and then the output wave contains the plate's guess about the out input uh, and then the parameters are adjusted. So instead of uh, storing, you know, weights and stuff as, uh, you know, tensors, you're, you're storing them as sound waves and they interact with each other. Um, through, you know, the additive and subtractive properties of, of sound waves, right? So like, this may this may be like, the review for some of you, but if you imagine you have like a sine wave like this, and then you have a sine wave of exactly equal amplitude and, you know, is like the same thing, but flipped around the y-axis and you add them, you get zero. Um, and if you have two sine waves that are exactly the same and you add them, you get uh, the same frequency, but double the amplitude, right? Um, and then you can decompose uh, a sound wave made of multiple sound waves into its uh, fundamental frequencies, the sound waves that make it up using a Fourier transform. So there's a lot of like stuff you can do with signal processing and, and noise noise and sound. Uh, and I literally had never thought of using it to do uh, like neural networks before. And I don't know, that thing is just cool as hell. Hey, Hector. Uh, yeah. And the... Uh, I'm just trying to get uh, quick information on the uh, the researchers if you wanted to look up more information. Okay, so Peter Mc... McMahon, maybe? McMahon, possibly? Um, the physicist engineer at Cornell and uh, University. So if you're interested in finding out more work, I would search for um, MCMAHON is the lead author. So just a cool project. Uh, Harvey says the majority of data we've never met because space expands way faster than light. Yeah, very true. We've got, we are in the grand scheme of things, so small, so fragile. All right, another research paper. This is a real paper. It was published in uh, Internet Histories, um, is the journal. I thought it was really, really cool. So if you're not familiar with GeoCities, it was sort of like an online um, sort of 90s, very popular way to host your own little website, right? So like back in the day. <laughs> um, and at one point it was one of the most, you know, popular places on the web. There were a lot of like, I don't remember what they were called, but there were things where like blog rings, link rings, something. Uh, but like if you had like your GeoCity site and then other people had theirs, you know, like you were related to each other, you might like, be part of the ring, like a telephone tree, right? Where like, you know, you go to somebody's blog and the, the bottom there's a link. It's like, go ahead in the ring, go back in the ring. And then you'd, you'd go through these related sites. And those were sort of like, um, you know, uh, very intentionally curated social networks for, for information discovery. Um, 
Yeah. And this uh, paper, so that was GeoCities, very important part of internet culture and internet history. Um, and in 2009, it was taken offline. And I remember this happening and sort of the, um, I don't know, the the keening, <laughs> the, co the collective grief from sort of people who'd been involved on, on GeoCities. Um, and uh, the paper goes through looking at uh, the web archives for GeoCities and sort of what was still on there and you know this this sort of archaeology almost of uh, digital archaeology because you know um a thing that is true of our current way of storing and creating knowledge is that it's almost all digital um and as such from an archival perspective is far more um impermanent than even writing something down on a you know, like regular non-low acid sheet of paper right like um, it's very easy for things that are on the internet to just completely disappear forever without a trace. Uh, and this is sort of a very well-documented platform takedown. Uh, and yeah, just a, a, an interesting sort of ethnography of the, uh, uh, of the process. And it is by uh, Kate McKinnon from the University of Toronto. So um, really interesting uh, sounding article. All right, other research. Um, so this is just more like a data set uh, uh, by Shreya uh, Rohatki. Um, also, I think that the links that I put in might have been slightly wrong. Anyway, uh, and this is an updated uh, version of the ACL anthology. And the way that it's described, it sort of makes it sound like this is the only ACL anthology corpus. There's a lot of them. <laughs> uh, but this one is nice because I believe it contains work up through the current year. Um, yeah, and I think could be uh, could be very helpful. And I think there's also some discussion in here about you know other places um, where other related uh, anthologies are. Um, yeah, yeah. So the ACL Anthology Network, um, which is sort of similar, only goes up to uh, 2016, and there've been you know the Transformer paper was 2017, so uh, obviously there've been a lot of change in the f changes in the field since then. Um, yeah, so just an interesting data set if you're interested in um, NLP or research on scholarly texts, um, could be an interesting one to check out. And it is on GitHub. Uh, the next one that I wanna talk about is sort of a, this could have gone into ethics as well, but I think it's very research focused. So, um, and this is, so if you're not familiar with authorship in research papers, it is very, uh, important. There's a lot of prestige tied up in it. Um, and basically the idea is when you're looking at a research paper and there's a bunch of authors, right? So let's look at uh, this one. Uh, so looking at these these two names, you can see there's a star here, which is probably going to be like an equal contribution. Equal contribution, yeah. Um, so unless it's specified otherwise, you assume that in order of authorship going down, each person had less and less to contribute to the paper, right? Uh, so in this case, uh, Simon and Charles uh, both had equal contributions and their contributions were the most important to the paper. Um, and sometimes you hear about people talking about first author and that's the person who had the most contribution to the paper. So like, it was not solely their work, but it was their work, right? Um, and sometimes you'll hear people talk about ghost authorship, which is this idea that like, uh, I'm not saying that this is true of this researcher, but like, let's say Renaud uh, here did not actually contribute to the paper, but like uh, his grant funding runs the lab, something. So he was just added as an author for that reason, even though he didn't actually make a scholarly contribution. Um, and also, you know, if your name's on a paper, you are responsible, even if you're not the first author, the first author is the most responsible, but you are responsible for what's in that paper, right? So if there was research misconduct, if there was data that was uh, falsified, if there's an error in the analysis, right? You have, you are taking on individual responsibility for that. Um, so who is an author? <laughs> and the order in which the authors appear, especially on a multi-author paper, is extremely important um, in scientific literature. Uh, and this question is sort of asking about like, okay, so in a situation where the most of the work, right, 
Uh, so what the paper is doing is like the contribution of this paper is a data set and the data set, the work to create the data set and the annotations have been done by either students or paid freelancers and they are not co-authors. So these people did the majority of the work that created the paper, but they are not authors on the paper. Is that ethical, right? Um, so just sort of a little bit of uh, discussion. Uh, main justification for annotators not to be co-authors seems to be the fact that they do not contribute directly to writing the paper. Everyone who writes the paper should be on the paper. But in reality, in most cases, the authors are never offered co-authorship or even the opportunity to contribute to the paper. While this appears to be standard practice in many institutions, it seems wrong to me to publish what amounts to be a report of the work of annotators with some added statistics and not acknowledging the annotators without whom publishing the paper would not have been possible. Uh, does someone know if any conference has published an explicit position about this? I'm not an expert in this kind of question, so any input would be greatly appreciated. Um, and just as a, a sort of like additional data point, in fields where human behavioral research is the thing you study, right? Like in psychology, you don't, uh, the, 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 the people who are donating their data or participating ex in the experiment, you need them to do the paper, but they are not authors, right? But in this case, uh, the people who are doing the contributions are scholars, right? They are trained in this task and sort of the, are doing the intellectual labor to do this. So should they be co-authors? Um, and you may be, if you're wondering like, well, what's the most number of co-authors you can have. Um, for some medical papers, it's not uncommon to have a hundred plus co-authors. Um, I think there was actually a medical paper with like 400 co-authors. Let me see if I can find it really quick. Uh, and basically all the students who worked on it, all the people who liked it, the analysis, um, etc., were co-authors on it. Uh, Sorry, I'm stealing, I'm trying to, to find uh, that really uh, highly co-authored paper and I don't see it quickly, but like if you, if you read medical papers, you will see that sometimes there are a lot of co-authors and multiple co-authors are the norm in uh, NLP. Um, so yeah, and then questions about crowdsourcing. Uh, if there's a lot of people who are providing annotations, are they authors, or are they research participants, right? And I think that's a, a pretty clear difference. Um, research participants have additional um, legal, particularly in the US, have additional legal protections. Your responsibility towards research participants are not the same as your responsibility towards your co-authors. Um, yeah. Uh, and then here's an example of a data set where all the annotators are authors. Um, so it is from this MIT paper. Uh, published in Tackle, which is, if you're, so Transactions of the Association for Computational Linguistics. <sighs> this is confusing. This is a journal. It is also, I believe it is also part of the ACL anthology. Papers that are accepted to Tackle are also presented at ACL conferences, uh, but Tackle papers are often a little bit longer. Uh, and here you can see we have uh, a lot of co-authors on this data, um, and you can see here that it's multilingual data set, so I'm assuming that many of these co-authors also just sort of like looking at the names and making general informed guesses <laughs> about, um, you know, where they might be from or what languages they might speak um, are probably providing the multilingual annotation. Uh, Dino says there was allegedly a physics paper with 5,000 co-authors. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Oh, was it the... Um, yeah, it was one of like the, one of the major CERN findings, right? I vaguely remember hearing about this. Yeah, so like a large number of authors on a paper is like not unheard of. And if they're doing scholarly work, right? If they're just not, if they're not just showing up and um, you are not treating them as research participants and they are spilling coffee on themselves, um, then yeah, I think they're co-authors, right? And Bless him. Uh, I know not everyone in NLP research has uh, taken a research ethics course or had direct expression in research ethics, but if somebody makes a contribution to the paper, they need to be a co-author. That is an explicit part of um, research ethics, particularly in the United States. Um, I'm less sure about Europe, but I mean, the scholarly norms are pretty much globally shared for better or worse. So anyway, just an interesting discussion. And uh, yeah, I'd like to see annotators being co-authors. They are doing the dang work, gosh darn it. Um, yeah. 
and then someone sort of like trying to change the like we're talking about just establishing scholarly disciplinary norms um and that this is like obviously uh adjacent to that so anyway uh yes Uh, and then Jay Alamer, who some of you may know, um, he's a he's a cohere now. He's done a lot of like online tutorials. Uh, had uh, an interesting um, little experiment that he did on uh, visual co-reference resolution. So co-reference resolution is the general task in NLP and also language processing, like in in human brains, of determining what a pronoun refers to. Um, is sort of one of the one of the types of the ways this, this task presents, right? So I'm using language, blah 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 blah. In a span of language, I may refer to the same thing multiple times. Co-reference resolution is being like, oh, all of these references are to exactly the same thing. Um, and in this case, um, this is sort of a uh, ambiguous <laughs> sentence, right? Uh, a chicken crossing the road because its color is purple, right? So it's here could refer. Um, I guess it could refer to a comic, uh, a chicken, or the road, right? Um, so the problem here is figuring out what it refers to and uh, using multimodal, um, you know, this, uh, what's the name of the task? <sighs> Generating an image from a caption. It's got a specific name and I just, I'm blanking on it more coffee. Um, and the interesting thing here is that sometimes the road is purple, uh, but also a lot of the times the sky is purple, which is not like in no world is that a valid co-reference resolution in here, right? The sky is not referenced at all. Um, and it looks like very rarely is the chicken purple. So, um, yes, I mean, <laughs> I, I think, you know, linguists like to um, wander around beating a drum, being like, uh, large language models are not expert language users. And I think this is a great, uh, you know, example of this for human. It is, you know, it might be ambiguous. You might say the chicken, you might say, I guess the comic uh, or the road would be purple, but you would never say the sky is purple given this input, right? That's not a, a valid co-reference for it. Anyway, just sort of interesting. Ooh. And now on to practical stuff. Uh, so first up, uh, Amazon has this series of uh, little explainers. This one's on Random Forest. I'll pop this in the chat if you want to check it out. Um, and they look pretty good. So if you're interested in sort of like very visualize-y uh, examples of, you know, different types of machine learning algorithms, uh, this seems to be uh, a pretty good way of doing it. Um, with lots of, you know, color coding and animations, et cetera. So um, yeah, also random forests are cool. I, uh, I am a big fan of random forests. So a good learning resource. All right, next up, oh. Um, this is one of my biggest pet peeves in engineering and design. Um, and if you build a system like this, and anyway, we'll talk about it and then I'll talk about why it just drives me up the dang wall. So uh, this is a story from Antonio Casilli, uh, who is a professor at IP Paris and Telecom Paris. Um, and this is a story about a computer vision um, Self, sorry, self checkout AI powered scanner that deep learns the bejesus out of food. So basically, uh, if you're going to a cafeteria and it's like a buffet and you're like, I'm getting some of this and some of this, and you pay by the item, um, you know, you put your plate on it, it scans it, it says what the items are, you pay the amount, and you leave. Um, oh, yeah, like I'm going to like Dirt Bobby, uh, the, the explainers. Um, and, you know, if that worked, it would stop the, the cashiers from having to look at it and be like, all right, that's one, you know, one broccoli, one beans, one rice, or whatever. Um, however, <laughs> however, uh, the issue is that, um, first of all, there was um, a lot of human later that was being occluded by the system, right? So uh, first they needed humans to uh, label the food in the images, right? Um, and you know, if it's just like a pan of food and you have taken a serving, uh, it may be very amorphous. 
Uh, the cashiers actually needed to do more work, so they needed to look at all the food, know if it was the right food, and then also look at the scanner output and determine if that was the right output. Um, and of course, uh, the system also didn't work very reliably or didn't work reliably enough to be useful. Um, so uh, they uh, basically forced the humans to change, right? Um, so they were like, this is the way to compose, uh, compose your meals, right? You can't put toppings on your yogurt. You can't put, you know, things on your, you know, I guess that's like a little crumpet or something. Um, instead, you have to have one food at a time, not testing. Not testing. Um, and as a uh, as a result, this digital system, which is supposed to be labor saving, not only was not labor saving, but also the system was used as an excuse to change human behavior. Right. So this is the thing. This is the thing that is my huge pet peeve. If you are engineering a system, right, that is interacting with humans in the world, I'm, mostly I see this with language data, right, um, and you cannot handle what is happening in the world robustly enough to be useful. The problem is your system. The problem is not the world. Um, there's a um, there's a, a story about this that um, you know which people talk about all the time in Google called uh, buying the gnome. Uh, so basically, the idea is that I think it was for sneakers, but in early search results for Google, if you search for sneakers, you'd get a gnome wearing sneakers. Um, I believe this is a story. If any of you know it, feel free to to chime in. Um, and they kept getting the gnome in the in the image, gnome in the image, gnome in the image, uh, and finally they somebody bought the gnome, right? So that it no longer showed up as the top result. Um, and this is an example of changing the world to make your system look better. Uh, well, in fact, it is not having any additional capacity to meaningfully and helpfully interact with the world. And when it comes to language data, the thing that is supposed to change is always people's language use. And listen, listen, if you are using language, right, as a human in the world, and you are being correctly understood by other humans in the world, there's nothing wrong with your language use. The problem is the system, right? Human language is a thing in and of itself um, that is right <laughs> because it works. Um, anyway, drives me nuts. Um, also extremely, um, you know, especially that type of like you have to change your behavior almost always ends up being um raising barriers to accessibility and making disabled folks lives much harder um so yes don't like it uh, a, a concrete example of that last thing would be like um, your system only works if the words are spelled correctly every time well if somebody has a language disability and has trouble spelling words correctly guess what it's just not going to work for them uh probably often enough that it, it makes their life harder Anyway, um, I hate it. <laughs> That's it, I hate it, it doesn't work. It sounds like nobody really enjoyed it. Um, oh, but you got to use AI tools to do things badly. All right. Um, uh, the TextXD conference is coming up. So I, one sec, I'm gonna check something really, really quick uh, before I say the thing that I'm about to say. Uh, let me, let me double check something before I say something wrong. Hold, please. Uh, and I know that I do this a lot, but it's because I don't want to say, like, I don't want to lie to you, right? Even unintentionally. Uh, so if I'm not sure about something, I do generally try to check it. Uh, let's see. D -d -d. Okay, I did not. Excellent. Uh, that was the, the question. I was trying to remember if I had a paper published at this menu, but I don't think I did. Um, and I did not, in fact. Uh, but this is text analysis across domains. Um, it's going to be in December, and I believe it is only going to be live. But if you are in <laughs> or near Berkeley and want to hang out, feel free to check it out. Um, and one thing that I do like about it is that it's an interdisciplinary conference, um, which are kind of rare. So it's a lot of people working on text for different reasons. <sighs> All right, this one. Uh, <laughs> I put this in because I think that it is um, a great example of some of the things that really frustrate me uh, about AI right now. So basically this guy is a philosopher, um, 
actually, I don't know for sure what this person's pronouns are. Uh, and I think that byline is all that we're gonna get. So, uh, but basically the thing is like, well, we can't be sure that AI won't kill all humans, so we have to act as if it will. Um, and the thing that um, really bothers me about something like this is because that is a hypothetical risk, right? That we have no strong empirical evidence is anywhere near possible, right? That, it, that an automated system will automatically, like of its own accord, develop agency and, and target humans. Um, we do have a lot of evidence of the actual harms of AI systems that are currently happening, right? Um, we'll talk about some more later today, but like, like this one, right? It doesn't work. It makes people spend more time doing dumb tasks. <laughs> it makes nobody's lives better except for people who um, just really enjoy using automated systems, I guess. Um, if you gain a, a, a pleasurable aesthetic experience from interacting with a computer vision system, then I guess you would like this. Um, otherwise, I don't think you would. Um, and you know this here is very low stakes right if someone accidentally gets slightly over or undercharged for cafeteria food item probably fine um but imagine this for testing right for especially for high stakes testing imagine this for university admissions imagine this for employment um we just talked about automated firing decisions that um I don't remember what the company was, but definitely it was contractors working for a deco working for a company, right? Where they just came in and they were like, you are fired because the computer says so. Um, so we have actual examples of clear harms that systems are actually doing right now, yeah? Um, and this sort of thing is like, we're gonna ignore those harms and we're gonna come up with more exciting hypothetical harms instead. Um, and the other thing is, if you are, <laughs> If you are worried about like potential, you know, extinction level events, buddy, there's one going on right now. Like, like, yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, technological changes can threaten existentially the future of humankind and the habitability of our planet for us and organisms like us. And buddy, it's happening, right? And you are wasting, you know, ink and breath talking about this when climate change is out there. Um, like, and this came out like the week that the, half of Pakistan uh, was underwater. Like, stuff like this, just like, why? <laughs> why do you think that this is the most important thing? Um, and it's sort of like the, the whole point of the piece, and you can read it if you want, I'm not gonna like it, um, was sort of like, you know, um, it may turn out <laughs> that any caution is just talking moonshine and the ASI is totally by nine. So A, uh, assuming that it happens uh, or even entirely impossible, which I would agree. Um, so ASI is this artificial super intelligence, I think is the, the claim here. Um, but I can't predict the future and neither can artificial intelligence researchers. Like, yeah, nobody can predict the future. An elephant might fall through the roof of my house and crush me. Like it's in the realm of possibility. It's just not likely. And it's not something that I should be directing my energy towards, right? There are other things that I can do that will have a more immediate impact um, and will deal with actual problems that people are actually having and not fake problems that you've made up. Anyway, a lot of pet peeves today. Ooh, yes. Uh, so this I thought was a really, really interesting article. It's in the Times of India. Let me uh, pop the uh, link to this in the chat. Um, so I'm sure many of you are intimately familiar with this <laughs> as uh, speakers of Indian languages or, or people who live in India. Um, but um, in terms of like linguistic diversity, uh, India is basically the Amazon rainforest, right? Um, so not only are there a lot of languages spoken in India, but also they are very unrelated to each other, right? Like less related than Turkish and English, right? Very unrelated to each other, very, very distinct. Um, which means it's not like being multilingual in Europe when you're like, yeah, I know French, Italian, and Portuguese, all these languages that share like a very common root. So there's a lot of cognates. And I mean, not that there are not cognates between Indian languages because there's a lot of language contact and borrowing, but like grammatically pretty similar or like, English, Dutch, and German, very similar languages, very closely related. And, you know, um, English and French are much more closely related than like, I don't know, uh, Tamil and Sanskrit, right? Very different languages. Uh, and uh, it's a really interesting piece about how 
how do they deal with it <laughs> in Wikipedia, right? Um, you have an extremely diverse language community. Um, you want to make sure that people can use your system. Um, what, what do you do in this extremely linguistically diverse situation? So, um, yeah. Uh, and I, I think that there's uh, sort of a, a nice point here. If there's one barrier to the critical resource of the amount of free information uh, available on Wikipedia, it's probably language. Um, so yeah, just a really interesting uh, discussion. Uh, you know, uh, Wikipedia articles are available in 25 languages spoken in English, which includes a tribal language called Santali. Um, it was the first tribal language to get its Wikipedia edition in its own script. Oh, that's another thing. Writing has been a thing in India for like a super duper 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 long time. Uh, and a lot of the writing systems are very different from each other. Um, which does make, you know, it can make your life a little bit easier as a linguist because you're like, ah, Tamil. <laughs> I know that one because it's written in the Tamil script. Um, but there's a lot of diversity in scripts in India. Um, anyway, just it, from a linguistic standpoint, just an extremely um, cool and interesting place. Um, also, not just from a linguistic standpoint, but, you know, that's what this article is talking about. Um, yeah, and they've, you know, they've done a lot of work uh, ensuring that complicated scripts, such as ones used for Indic languages, can be used to support Wikimedia websites, uh, and clients with internet standals, uh, international standards such as Unicode and ISO. And I'm, there are scripts currently being used by people alive in India that don't have Unicode characters for them, so that's a big challenge. Um, you know, you are not only, <laughs> not only are you trying to curate this digital resource in a language that's under-resourced, um, you know, you may not be able to use Unicode to represent the characters of that language, so you either need to transliterate, or you need to go to the Unicode committee and be like, hey, <laughs> this language is missing. I need these characters added to Unicode, which, as you might imagine, is a very involved process. Um, so, yeah, very, very... Um, like, in terms of engineering challenges, this is uh, way, way up there. Yeah. Uh, Robbie says, if you know Hindi, you almost understand 70% of Northern Indian languages. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously there are areas where there's a lot more relationship between the languages, but... Yep. Um, and just a couple of languages, you know, Hindi, Tamil, Telugu... Um, there's Marathi. There's a lot of languages spoken in India. Um, Yes, and then this is the thing that I was just like, wow, can you imagine going up to just like somebody in San Francisco who's born and raised in the US and be like, hey, you personally need to know 20 to 30 languages uh, to do this job. Um, anyway, just really, really um, amazing article about this very, very difficult problem, both from an engineering standpoint and a linguistic standpoint and a social standpoint um, and how Wikimedia is dealing with it. Unlike some other companies that just aren't Facebook, <laughs> and are just sort of not giving some languages uh, any resources around, say, content moderation. Anyway, moving on. Um, so this was, uh, I think, a really good piece from the book. Uh, so the book is called Data Mesh. It's an O'Reilly book. Uh, but this quote uh, really resonated with me, so I thought I would share it. Um, uh, Ravi says, Marathi, you can also understand. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're fairly closely related, um, Hindi and Marathi, but um, yeah. Actually, I, let's, let's look it up. Uh, Telugu and Malayam, they're totally different. Yeah. Um... Oh, yikes. Uh, so I looked at, uh, here, I actually popped this into the, uh, this one. So I was just looking up uh, how many languages are spoken in India, because I thought that was a, a cool thing to look up. Oh, interesting. So in Mozilla, uh, I got a little bar. I'm not seeing it here. Um, I got a little bar. Oh, it's because... Interesting. Anyway, I got a little bar that said, um, I can't show it without doing a lot of messing around uh, about climate impact on India, uh, which I just thought was, was interesting. Uh, anyway, oh, I was actually looking for, <laughs> I was looking for a, uh, a general uh, count, but 
when I was like, these are super duper duper unrelated languages, this is what I mean, right? Um, so like these languages and the sort of the lime green are really related to each other. Um, these languages and sort of this like dark, darker outside of the lime green are fairly related to these ones. Uh, these yellow ones, which are just up at the top, I think are not related at all. Dravidian is not Indo-European, so all these blue ones are completely different. Uh, the purple ones, again, completely different. <laughs> uh, the, the, the red ones, again, completely different, like completely different language families. Um, and as you can see, we've got some uh, up here at the top that uh, have no relationship to any other known language. Uh, that's what a language isolate means. So like Basque is a language isolate, um, which is spoken in, in Europe. Um, yeah, and so there's 23 official languages, but uh, many, many more others that are not, which I think is what they mean by tribal languages. Um, yeah, so it's got 447 uh, languages that are used in India. Um, and it's, like I said, it's a huge hotspot for linguistic diversity. Um, anyway. Uh, yeah, imagine that this is the country that you're working in and you need to provide useful, correct information to people in all of these languages. And like, obviously there's like, you know, a lingua franca of sort of the educational stuff uh, that's English, but still very difficult. Uh, right, so this that really stuck out to me. No, I'm getting coffee everywhere today just gesturing a lot uh, there's something unique about data the difference between data product ownership and other types of products is the unbounded nature of data use cases the ways in which particular data can be combined with other data and ultimately turned into insights and actions at any point in time data product owners are aware or can plan for what is known today and viable use cases for their data while there remains a large portion of unknown future use cases for the data produced today perhaps beyond that their imagination and these of course are you know benign use cases but also malevolent, malevolent use cases um and i think that that is a really important point <laughs> uh, and again i you know, if you are coming into language data for the first time, or, you know, you've previously done rule-based things and now you're more into uh, machine learning um, and you've, you're doing data collection as part of your work, um, what's gonna happen with that data, right? Do you have, you know, even, even if you are, you know, a researcher in the United States working under NSF funding where you need to have a data retention plan, um, it's a data retention plan, right? You need to say how you're going to use the data and when and what you're going to do with it and how you're going to store it. Um, but usually it doesn't include how you're going to delete it and when. Um, so, yeah. And then of course there's like the second part of that question, which is like deleting data means that you no longer have access to it, which you know is privacy preserving. But thinking about that GeoCities use case does mean that you are losing, you know, you're losing something important with no backup, right? So do you print it out <laughs> and archive it and then delete it? Or um, how do you maintain archival use while preserving privacy? Um, and you just can't. You can't know how people are going to use your data. You can't know how people are going to combine your data with other data into the future. Uh, and it is, I guess in some ways it's a lot like farming, right? You have a stewardship of a resource that's going to continue to be used in the future. Um, and you have, you know, I would argue a moral and ethical responsibility to ensure that that resource is both usable in the future, but also um, that you are considering uh, the, the wider society that you live in and also you know your neighbors, if you will, right? Like others in your, in your ecosystem. So um, sort of in the, in the farming metaphor, um, runoff, right? So runoff from, let's say fertilizer, goes into the river, goes into the watershed, causes an algal bloom, kills all the fish, um, creates pollution, et cetera. So your choices in your smaller ecosystem have a, a, an impact in the larger ecosystem. And for data, we can think about that runoff being things like data brokers, right? Um, so, you know, you use it for advertising, somebody buys it, <laughs> they use it to, you know, they sell it to the police and then uh, the police use it to, you know, um, I mean, in the U.S. just kill people. Uh, that tends to be, unfortunately, the, very common here in the United States. But so, yeah, I think this is a really good way of thinking about it and something that I sort of like instinctually know, but it was really nice to see it written out. 
Cognition says, it probably won't even be you who decides what happens with a waiter. Yeah, very true. Like I've collected data uh, at places I no longer work and where I no longer have access to it. Um, yeah. Hi, Chrono. Welcome, welcome. All right. Oh, also, this is just cool. Um, for those of you who use R, uh, there is uh, uh, this package called PDF Tools uh, that lets you do a lot of stuff with PDF files in like a programmatic way, so you're not doing it by hand. Don't don't manipulate files by hand. <laughs> but save your sanity, save your time. That's what computers are for. Um, so you can join, split, and compress PDF files uh, in our strats, and uh, you know. Uh, Sylvia here extracted a specific chapter from a 3,000 page PD long PDF with two lines of code. So sounds like a very user-friendly package uh, and it's by our open size. So uh, if you are interested, uh, you can check it out uh, and I'll post a link to the code uh, so that you can see that as well. Uh, yeah, uh, I saw that and was like, I bet people will like that. <laughs> uh, Latour says it's uh, good to know. <laughs> Cognition says, don't touch that data with your dirty human fingers. I mean, yeah, or, you know, waste your precious finite time being alive doing something repetitive that a computer can do. Unless doing that repetitive thing that a computer can do brings you happiness, in which case, I'm, I'm like, I'm not your boss. I'm not going to tell you not to. But... Um, and I say this because, so when I was, uh, you know, before I was comfortable coding, <laughs> I knew about Bash, um, I spent at one point in my life, uh, weeks of time working, you know, longish days, manipulating files by hand, and it was the worst. <laughs> and I don't want that for you. It's very avoidable. All right, next up. Hmm. So this is a spicy paper. Um, so you may remember, I think we talked about it last week that Proctor.io um, lost a court case maybe, or like they had an injunction filed about them. But basically it's this online proctoring software. And one of the things they were doing is having students scan their rooms. Um, and I believe a judge said that this was a violation of students' privacy, so they couldn't do that. Um, so these are extremely invasive programs that are designed to detect if students are cheating. And then this study, they cheated intentionally to see if they were caught. Uh, and none of the people who caught, who cheated, were caught. So uh, none of the cheating students were flagged by Proctor.io, whereas only one of out, out of the six was caught by an independent check by a human agent. The sensitivity of Proctor.io based on this experience should therefore be put at very close to zero. Um, on the whole side, they found it easy to set up and worked with, um, and they think that it would be a deterrent to cheating. But again, it doesn't work. So you are trading students, again, children's privacy for technology that doesn't doesn't work. <laughs> Let's like this, right? Like um, you're you're forcing people to change their behavior, right? And do their food like this and not put any toppings on anything to do because your system doesn't work. Ooh. Uh, and in this case, I would say that the system not working is adjacent to people being forced to change their behavior. But the fact remains that it's indefensible because it doesn't work. Um, and also, you know, I think there's a lot of a thing that I am constantly just like frustrated by is people misrepresenting their system's capabilities, right? Like if it doesn't work very well, it might still be helpful, but people need to know how effective your system is, right? That's part of good engineering. That's part of good research is telling your people when it will work and how and how well. And if you don't, and if you misrepresent your system and you're like, oh yeah, I can do all these things it can't do, A, you're depleting the scarce resource of public trust in automated technology. And B, you're, you're lying. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? <laughs> Ugh. Anyway, things like this just, they get my goat and I, I don't know, I care. <laughs> uh, people talking about my, uh, my misadventures spent um, uh, editing files. Yeah, I mean, you know, a little, a little personal background. I didn't have access to the internet until I went to college, right? Like I just didn't have it when I was in high school. I had to walk five miles to the public library and I didn't do that very often as you might imagine. Um, so yeah, like I really had no way to learn programming. Um, I had a distance learning course where they tried to teach us Visual Basic.net, but nobody there knew how to code. And the instructor, 
don't think I ever met with the instructor and also they weren't available. So it was just like we were trying to do online lessons together where nobody knew what they were doing and they weren't very good. Um, so that was my previous experience with, with programming. And it made me feel that I was maybe bad at programming because I was not really good at Visual Basic.net based on like a, a PowerPoint <laughs> that I was having a hard time following. So, yep. Uh, but then I learned to program and now I work in technology and you can do it too. Uh, yeah. Michael says, declare limitations. Yes, absolutely. Every time. Like, can you imagine like a truck manufacturer, right? And they're like, here's this truck. It'll haul five tons and it won't haul five tons. And somebody puts five tons on the truck and they drive away and they leave the chassis behind, right? Like, it's not acceptable in other engineering fields. Why do we get away with it? I mean, I know why we get away with it, but still. Uh, Latour says, uh, I, uh, same, I never touched internet until I was in college, so the mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, rural kids. Wow. Yep. Uh, Mommy says AI slavery, yeah. <sighs> yeah, we'll talk about something very relevant uh, to that a little bit later on. Um, Anyway, uh, so Signal, this is just, this is just scuttled about this a little bit of gossip. Uh, so Signal, if you're not familiar with it, it's like a messaging app that's encrypted. So like WhatsApp is very much not. <laughs> um, and so if you care about privacy, like a lot of reporters, I learned about Signal first because reporters would use it to protect the uh, anonymity of their sources. Um, it's like security is like the main thing about it. Uh, and they hired Meredith Whitaker, who used to be at Google and organized like the Google walkout for, um, against Maven, I want to say. Um, anyway, so very involved in the AI ethics space. Uh, and she is now uh, the president of Signal. Um, and I think this is a little bit of a misrep misrepresentation of uh, her her policy, but it is, you know, something that she's brought up is that it would be good to pay for, which honestly I think is reasonable, right? If you are, it's one of those things with like free VPNs, right? They're like, our service is free. <laughs> it definitely incurs costs for us. Um, how are you making money? Is it selling data? Is it selling data? It's selling data, yeah. Um, so anything that's like really privacy preserving, um, I, I don't tend to trust the free versions because I don't know how they're making money. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah but Michael Lala says mar marketing fluff. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Which, you know, you can't lie about what your drugs do. I feel like you also shouldn't be able to lie about what your algorithms do, but mm, that's just me. Uh, yep. Uh, Electra says, I would pay for Signal if they leave my data and privacy alone. If it's free, you're the product. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> this is not heaven. Yeah, I mean, it's it makes sense, right? You're a software technology. You need to pay for software engineers. You need to pay for hosting. You need to pay for blah, 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 blah. But uh, Bobby says, I've been using a computer since 2016. Nice. Yeah, but never, never too late to start, right? Yep. Uh, Harrington says, I've been trying to move conversation threads into Signal. Yes. And I think you can pay for Signal, and I think that's sort of how they've been, you know, doing stuff, but uh, yeah. All right. Oh, speaking of money <laughs> and paying engineers. So this is impractical because it's probably going to affect everybody who works for a company that also hires in California. Um, so if you've seen things recently where like it's a job posting and they're like, in Colorado, we pay this much. Um, that's because Colorado now has a law that when you post a job posting, you have to say what the salary is going to be. Um, and now California is also requiring that, which means that if you are uh, applying for a job at a company that also exists in California, a lot of tech companies, um, they're going to have to post. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they would be willing to hire in California, they're gonna have to post the salary. So I think this is gonna um, really empower workers, particularly during like wage negotiations. Um, and yeah, very, uh, very good to see. So this will be coming out soon. It was passed on Tuesday. I don't know when it's actually gonna start. Uh, and Newsom might veto it, but I hope he doesn't. Um, yep, and so they sort of bring up uh, the issue of, uh, you know, uh, wage pay gaps and uh, yep. So keep an eye on that. Uh, Latro says, finally, yeah, very exciting stuff. And then there's this. Um, so I'm not going to go through this thread, but basically, um, I, I called this AI spiritualism um, earlier. So if you're not, 
I'm going to info it up. <laughs> so if you're not familiar with spiritualism, it was a movement from like the mid 1800s to like the early ish, uh, 1900s, um, mostly in English speaking companies. So predominantly in the U S and, uh, the UK and Canada, and also maybe a little bit in Australia and New Zealand. Um, where like, basically the whole thing was like, people were like, I can talk to ghosts and I can talk to the ghosts of your loved ones. And you can send messages to the other side. So if you're familiar with like seances where people will like sit in a room and hold old hands and like try to communicate with the dead that spiritualism um and first of all i want to say that i think that it was genuinely helpful for a lot of people and i'm i'm not going to decry it and i also think a lot of people did have like very sincerely held beliefs that they were talking to the dead uh and i don't you know i've talked before about self-determination i'm not going to say that somebody's sincerely held beliefs for the wrong beliefs um but uh, also there are a lot of people who did this who would really um, intentionally mislead people for their own financial gain, right? So I want to say Houdini was really famous for debunking spiritualists um, and sort of like going through and being like, ah, you're doing this and this and this to trick people into thinking that you have like ghost powers. Um, and a lot of the... Uh, Part of the reason that it was so successful was that so many people died. <laughs> uh, like, right, there were a lot of mass casualty events. There were a lot of wars. There was World War I. Um, there was, uh, you know, the great influence of the pandemic. And so people had lost a lot of loved ones. Also, child mortality was super high. Um, so yeah, people had a lot of dead people they wanted to connect with. And uh, it really sort of preyed on the credulity of people that wanted to believe this. At least some people were uh, to take their money, basically. Anyway, um, I would say that this is basically that, but with a new, <laughs> a new rapper. And basically what they're saying is like, oh, this is a person, right? So they have named this person Loab because they said that it was the, uh, the opposite of the embedding space of Brando. Um, so like Marlon Brando, which is the name of an actor. Uh, and they're like, oh, you can see so many examples of this person or, um, sort of like an image that has similar features. Um, and they like obviously they got like a lot of likes and people being like oh it's so cool it's so creepy um I'm like yeah i think this if this is you know storytelling and art using the eye that's fine but i think some people are taking it literally as like there is a person living <laughs> in the neural network um which is not the case um and there was a really good thread and i will share this thread i'm not going to share the original one <laughs> cognition says uh there's a ghost in the machine a eh? Oh, yes, uh, link to the, I'm assuming that's to the, uh, the privacy law for show. Um, yes, uh, but, uh, so Matthew Scala here, who, uh, it doesn't say in their bio, uh, but previously researched on this sort of idea. Um, so this was created with negative prompts. So saying like, I want X, but the opposite of it, of it right? So I would, like, if I would say, in uh, I'm trying to come up with like a language based example, <laughs> right? So like, I guess the opposite of like an emo song would be a, a happy nursery rhyme or something would be my sort of expectation of what that prompt should do. Um, and like I posted the, the links, you can look through the whole thing, but uh, the, the sort of the general point is that the fact that you're going to get convergence with a lot of negative prompts is a, um, uh, emergent quality of um, spatial representations, right? Um, so tensors, listen, I'm going to explain what tensors are super quick. If you know what they are, good job. <laughs> so basically you have, you know, uh, a vector, which is a single dimension, a matrix, which is two dimensions, and a tensor, which is three dimensions, right? So tensor flow. I'm assuming most of you are familiar with tensors, but in case you're not, you know, just helpful, helpful little view. Um, and then of course, you know, multi-dimensional tensors, more than three dimensions are how we do embedding spaces, which is how a lot of stuff works basically. Um, and the point is that like, if you're in the space and you're like, get me the furthest away point from this point, for a lot of points, the furthest away point is gonna be the same point, right? So uh, to say here, uh, even if you start far from the center, when trying to run away from your starting point, you're always going to be able to go past the center on the other side, you're going to end up on the surface, right? So if I'm in an orange and I'm like, I need to get as far away from the orange or like, hold please, I have some tetrahedrons. 
So if I, <laughs> if I had some sort of solid polygon and I was in the middle of it and I was like, I need to get as far away from this as possible, I'd go to an edge, right? I'd probably go to a vertex. Or if I had, <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna look at the chat. If y'all are roasting me, it's fine. I know I'm a nerd. Um, and if I wanted to go from this point to the farthest away point, even though I'm pretty far from the center, the farthest away point is going to be the opposing vertex, right? So I'm never gonna stop at the center because I can always go farther away. So you're going to have convergence on the faces or the vertexes uh, or the vertices. And as a result, the fact that you get a stable percept, so it is a stable percept because as a human, we're looking at it and being like, oh yeah, this is the same thing over and over again, is the result of the fact that we are working in a multidimensional space and we're trying to move away from things is sort of the, the general gist there. Um, yeah, so I thought just a cool, uh, very clear explanation of what's going on here. Um, obviously is not getting anywhere near <laughs> as much traction as the original uh, sort of spooky ghost story just in time for Halloween. Um, yep, so uh, yeah. I thought it was a really good explanation and uh, can like help to build my intuitions about negative prompts for sure, and maybe did for you as well. And if you're interested in more papers uh, in, in this link, there's a couple here, uh, and it looks like this one's probably going to be the, the most recent one, which is approximate for this neighbor with application to annulus query. Mm, and the reason that this is put in here <laughs> is because of the thing that I just talked about. So if you looked at this and you were like, ah, this person is the last author, they didn't make a very big contribution. Um, uh, this person is saying like, actually, you know, I made an equal contribution that the order is not uh, significant. Uh, and actually looking at it, it's probably alphabetized. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so vector X, Y, tensor X, Y, Z, or X, Y, Z, dot, 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 it can be more than three. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> So uh, another thing that I thought was pretty interesting is um, I'm very interested in, I mean, we've talked about it a lot, right? Disinformation and misinformation and also botnets, uh, because if it is, so misinformation is like a mistaken belief that someone is spreading. Disinformation is intentionally misleading information that's being spread. Botnets are often one way to do this, particularly by like state-sponsored actors or, you know, corporations or you know, crime people. Um, and this is an example of a, uh, a botnet uh, that tar targets uh, English and Arabic. So a little, a little multilingual action for us. Uh, and you can see like, how do you know it's a botnet? So I've, sometimes I've got questions about this from sort of like, if you do research on Twitter, you do want to filter out the bots. And how do you figure out that they're bots? I mean, very consistent posting schedule is usually the thing that I would use. Uh, but this is sort of like going through how uh, this, this person uh, figured out that these were bots. So all of these accounts were created uh, at the same time. They all use the same naming schema. Uh, they've never tweeted or liked a tweet, right? So they've never done regular um, information Twitter activities. Um, they also have shared profile pictures. Uh, it's probably not that they have a bunch of doppelgangers. Uh, and they follow a bunch of <laughs> uh, English and Arabic language accounts. Most of them are cryptocurrency, NFT, Web3 being a recurrent theme, um, which means that these people bought followers from this botnet, almost certainly. Um, and they also follow both this dude and Twitter. We, we don't talk about him on the channel. Um, and uh, you can sort of see um, the, the patterns here, right? So normal human patterns, normal human sort of behavior online, you're gonna see a little bit of bi diurnal patterns, right? Um, you're probably gonna see some seasonality across weeks. You're probably gonna see some yearly seasonality. You're not gonna see on, off, on, off, on, off. That's not a thing that humans do on a strict schedule. That's bot behavior. Um, yeah, so you can sort of see uh, <laughs> uh, there, that if you look by uh, follow order by creation date, plots for the accounts, um, the accounts that were created first followed first. Um, so they were just going through the list and mass following basically. Um, in a wacky coincidence, this botnet follows many of the same accounts as the spammy cryptocurrency accounts that recently expressed irritation that I, with other spammy cryptocurrency accounts that were being sold on a dodgy website. Uh, yep. Anyway, um, just sort of an interesting, I guess, forensic linguistic sort of um, breakdown of how you would detect that uh, it's a botnet account. <laughs> Cognition says I have some afternoon reading cut out for me. Yeah. Uh, 
And if you if you are interested, uh, I'll post a link to this as well. Uh, uh, Conspirador Nortenio in particular does a lot of research on bot accounts and botnets, uh, and would be uh, a cool person to follow if you're interested in this sort of um, general discussion. Also, Kate Starbird uh, does a lot of work on, on disinformation and misinformation, and uh, uh, excuse me, <coughs> especially political social movements. So. Yeah. Uh, Matro says, I've been reading a lot about botnets. I wonder if they use NLP for semantic analysis. Um, oh, for detecting bots. I don't know. Um, I mean, mainly the interesting thing about botnets, the useful thing about botnets is that they can follow people and not necessarily. So in this case, these are probably followers for buying and not necessarily accounts spreading disinformation. But uh, yeah, that would definitely be interesting for the, the disinformation uh, use case. And I talk a little bit more about that on a video I have from a couple weeks ago called um, uh, Malicious Use of <laughs> Hold please. <laughs> Let me tell you what it's called so you can actually find it. Oh, wait, I can put it in the chat, couldn't I? Um, the video is called... Uh, yeah, possible malicious, malicious uses of natural language generation. So I'll, uh, I'll pop this in the chat for you to take a look at if you are interested. Alatra says, I cannot wait to learn NLP because I also love languages. Yeah, it is a, uh, it's a great field uh, and I really enjoy working in it. Even though I get irritated, right? Like, I don't know. I, some things about me is that A, I'm almost always sincere. <laughs> you can tell that I'm not being sincere because I'll make a weird face. Um, and B, like, the reason that I get, like, so frustrated with people is because I care so much, right? Like, I really believe in the power of language technology. I really, like, it's changed my life. I really believe that it can change other people's lives. And it can be, you know, this wonderful force for good and accessibility and um, make it just, like, easier to be a human, man. Um, and when people do it bad, it just frustrates me. <laughs> it makes me so upset. Do better, please. Anyway. All right, and so this is from uh, Emily Bender. Um, so if you don't know her, she also works on um, um, you know, AI ethics, I would say, at the University of Washington. We'll talk about her in just a sec. Actually, I'll do these in this order. Uh, so this is uh, a, a video that I talked about a while ago, or it was a live stream where Emily Bender and Alex Hanna uh, talked about this uh, uh, this piece by uh, Blaze, where he's talking about um, sort of like AI and how great it is, and they're sort of uh, you know I don't I don't care about the football, <laughs> and they're talking about you know but basically they're peer reviewing this article which had been published and sort of marketed uh, but not really peer reviewed, and they're sort of doing that process live. Um, so if you're interested, uh, this is a good video, and as you can see, uh, Alex Hanna also has her own uh, their own. Alex, I'm sorry if I got your pronouns wrong. I don't remember them off the top of my head. Um, Alexana also has a channel, so uh, you can check that out, and I'll pop that in the chat as well. Yeah. Uh, Latra says, I'm currently learning two languages and fluent in three, and I'm seeing so much similarity in human languages. Uh, it intrigues me how we find so many ways to codify meaning. Ah, uh, Latra, you may be interested in um, just straight up linguistics, not just NLP. Um, so if you're really interested in sort of like cross language differences, um, typology would be the, the subfield that would be particularly interesting. So linguistic typology, um, looking at relationships between languages, uh, and then also meaning would be uh, semantics. Um, so study of meaning. <laughs> uh, and if you, if you have a computer science background, semantics will probably feel pretty familiar because uh, a lot of it is based on, on formal object a formal object and like lambda calculus. So if those are things you're familiar with already, you'll probably be like, oh yeah, I know this. So, yeah. All right. Uh, and this is sort of a, um, another uh, <laughs> uh, blog post that she's talking about how it's um, pretty disleading. Um, and I would say that this article is dislead disleading, misleading. Uh, because it is assigning uh, systems that do not have agency or, you know, a sense of self, those things um, in a way that I think is going to cause false beliefs about what they can do and can't do in uh, particularly lay people. So, uh, the analytics. Typology. Yeah, linguistic typology. 
uh, it was one of my favorite classes I took in undergrad was, I think it was called like world languages and their structures or something, but it's, uh, yeah. Whatever you thought you knew about language, there's almost certainly a language that doesn't do it. <laughs> or does it, but in a weird way. Um, yeah. All right, next up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so speaking of Facebook and court, which we're going to talk about quite a bit, uh, there was, uh, you know, a previously sealed court hearing in March, which has been unsealed, um, where Facebook engineers are sort of talking about what happens with user data in Facebook. And the answer is nobody really knows, right? Um, so you have this, this little, um, tra not transcript, uh, anecdote here, which, I mean, is not surprising to me as someone who has you know worked in a large tech company but i think might be surprising to a lot of people which is it would take multiple teams on the ad side to track down exactly where the user data flows i wouldn't be surprised i would be surprised if there's even a single person that can answer that narrow question conclusively referring to a question of exactly where personal data might be stored <clears throat> within 55 Facebook subsystems, which were the current, which were the subject of the hearing, right? And if you've worked in a large tech company, like you'll be familiar with this, right? Different teams doing different things. They care about different things. They don't really talk to each other because that slows them down. So they're all building their own things. They're slightly different. They have slightly different words. You know, these two project managers don't like each other. So they're never in meetings together. Um, this project manager is trying to get a promotion and knows that, that if that project manager runs that project, they'll get the promotion. So they sort of like cut them out of meetings. Um, there's a lot of internal politics. Um, and then also so like, you know, this set of engineers wants to do things their way. Um, and also Facebook is pretty well known in terms of engineering culture for being a little, um, I'm trying to think of a word other than slapdash, uh, <laughs> really embracing the, the sort of move fast and break things. Um, so like I would be shocked if any sizable portion of the Facebook uh, code base was like well commented, for example, or like successfully documented. Um, so yeah, I mean, this doesn't surprise me, right? Like large institutions get messy quickly and large technical institutions do that as well. Um, and things just don't sort of speak to each other. And it's all very, I know from the outside, like working at a big tech company seems like all very like shiny and cool and it'll be, you know, very optimized and streamlined. Um, there's a lot of duct tape and bailing wire <laughs> involved, which I'm sure is not particularly, uh, uh, reassuring if you rely on those companies to make product decisions that don't cause you to not have a job anymore, but there we go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, reckless, fast and loose. Yes, great terms, absolutely. Uh, oh yeah, uh, yeah, Russian is really interesting because it has a very rich morphology and a very uh, flexible syntactic um, sort of ordering. So English is very rigid structure and very sort of limited morphology, yeah. Russian's cool. All languages are cool. All right. Uh, and then uh, I bring this up because they had uh, their most recent uh, newsletter just went out, uh, but Just Tech from the Social Science Research Council, which I don't know that I've talked about before. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Emphasizing velocity, uh, Chrono Zero says about Facebook engineering. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, yes, speaking of things that just like, I, I think you've probably gotten a pretty good, I mean, if you tune into the channel a lot, you've gotten a pretty good like sense of my ethos as like a technical practitioner. And that is I like small, purpose-built, self-contained systems that are developed like with enough time. <laughs> um, which, I mean, I'm sure that that comes in no small part from my scientific training, where that is very much like the way you do science. Um, but anyway, yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, so they just took out or just sent out their most recent newsletter, uh, and they've got a lot of really good information and content uh, if you are if you're interested in uh, learning more about their work. So I would just check it out. Uh, and I believe the Social Science Research Council is a, um, I believe the Linguistic Society of America is part of it. So it's an organization of technical uh, professional organizations of who focus on social science research. Um, so yeah, just cool organization slash research venue. And they also have a newsletter you can sign up for. All right. <laughs> Uh, and I want to share this from, from Talia because they shared it on Twitter and it just made me laugh. Um, and we talked about, um, uh, I want to be able to read as many language scripts as possible. Hell yeah. Even if I'm not fluent in that language, uh, that sounds like hell <laughs> to me. Uh, 
um, uh, I am. I think I, I think I've mentioned this previously. Uh, probably today that I'm dyslexic. Um, learning scripts in particular is like chewing glass. <laughs> it is the worst. Um, yeah, uh, very, very, very difficult for me. Um, I the only class in college that I got very close to failing was uh, second semester Chinese because the majority of your grade came from um, remembering what characters meant what words. Uh, and like my speaking was OK. Um, I'm not fabulous at tonal languages, and I had sort of a lot of very young exposure to Cantonese, so I tend to get told that my tones sound a little bit Cantonese-y. Um, I'm not trying to, it's just structural um, learning. Anyway, uh, yeah. Yeah, I also uh, I started to try to learn Hindi, but the, the writing system just, oh. I can't. I'm so sorry, y'all. I mean, I could, but I wouldn't be able to do anything else like in a day if I spent a large amount of time like focused on on learning a writing system. Yeah. Uh, I have ADHD. One of the perks is it makes it makes me curious. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Neurodivergence. Click. Um. Oh, my cup says uh, Python. It's good for you. I know it's a little bit hard to read because it <laughs> it looks transparent. Anyway, uh, so this is Olba Shea from Talia. Um, current AITP talk is like, I'm building AGI. The path to AGI is gradually dependently typed probabilistic programming languages that support path equality, a la HOTT. And I just, what? <laughs> Those are all certainly words. Um, anyway, so this is a, a, a person that she's reacted to. And this is just like, this is nothing. <laughs> So there's a concept um, called word salad that means like just a lot of words are put together but don't have any coherent meaning when combined. Um, it's a symptom of some types of aphasia um, or also uh, being in marketing. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Um, marketing is difficult and it's a profession and you know, people, it's important to tell people about things that they need, but, um, and in a capitalistic society, marketing is how you do that. But sometimes, particularly in technical fields, the things that you are told are not true things or even real things or possible things. Uh, and this is one of those. So yeah, uh, if anyone starts to talk like this, uh, they are either um, misinformed or being intentionally dishonest is how I would say, <laughs> how I would uh, uh, interpret something like that. All right. Uh, and then this was particularly interesting. So uh, Graham is associate professor at CMU. That's Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon University here in the United States, um, and uh, sharing the travails of looking up, um, uh, you know, the state of the art for English. So first of all, English is easy mode. So easy mode, trying to find the state of the art, part of speech tagger, named entity recognizer, dependency parser, and semantic role labeler, right? So part of speech is like noun, verb, adjective, adverb. Uh, named entities are things like Paris, Brazil, India, Amharic, right? Like things. Uh, dependency parsers are, um, so in this one? Good job, Rachel. <laughs> Sorry, I have like 80 tabs open right now and I just clicked on the right one on the first try. Um, Depends the parser would be like, okay, so it's here refers to chicken or it's here refers to road and creating a, a former hier formal hierarchical structure to capture that relationship. Nice. Uh, or semantic role labelers. So those are things like agent, patient, um, instrument, etc. What so this entity is doing what in this sort of like linguistic representation? Um, and trying to find actual usable code. And this is where it all breaks down, right? So everyone will tell you, you know, if they have a great system, they're like, oh, here's, I'm state of the art, look at my graphs, look at my performance, but can I find and use the code? And the answer is, well, <laughs> Um, and I thought this was just like such a such a microcosm of what it is to try and bring research work um, into the commercial world. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, Latour says, "Ah, you speak parser tongue, uh, Python." <laughs> uh, yep. <laughs> uh, Mikolela says, uh, "Dunning Kruger at its finest." About this person, although I mean, it sounds like uh, this is a senior person, so presumably should know what they're talking about. So in this case, you know, this sounds like somebody who is looking for funding, if I had to guess. Uh, yep. 
Uh, and then just a bunch of discussions about like people suggesting different tools, you know, some are available, some are not. Um, no clear consensus about what the actual tool that has actual state of the art is, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, yeah, and also just like a lot of pipeline recommendations, which may or may not be helpful. So I'm gonna share this tweet if you're interested in checking it out, but I think that it is uh, uh, very illuminating <laughs> that someone who works in the field does not know what the best tool is given uh, the fact that we are so metric successed as a field. So even on those metrics, doesn't know what the best tools are and can't find them to use them. Anyway, politics, uh, mostly court cases. So politics, I mean things like legislation and court cases and things that would affect my work. Nine Gaming says, if this is a state for English, how much worse would it be for other languages? Way worse. Although I guess for a lot of languages, there's like one. So um, finding the thing that has state of the art is pretty easy. Getting it to work, probably less so. All right, first of all, US folks, if you were on Facebook in 2010, um, there is a $90 million data tracking settlement. It's a class action lawsuit, which means that the lawsuit was brought on behalf of a group of people, in this case, people who use Facebook in 2010, because Facebook was like, oh, we're not tracking you across websites, and they absolutely were. Um, so if you are in the US and use Facebook in 2010, you are entitled to a part of this money. Um, yes, so check it out. Uh, yeah, and I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but like, yep. Uh, and also, speaking of Facebook uh, having to pay huge fines, this is actually a fine uh, and not a class action settlement. Uh, fine. Um, <laughs> uh, don't worry, this is not my usual browser. Um, it found that uh, Instagram was letting kids do things like create business accounts, which shared their personal information, like their phone numbers, um, which, yikes. Um, so yeah, not great. Uh, and they're getting a 400 million euro fine. Um, so yes, big fines coming for, uh, for Meta, Facebook, and it's the second highest fine after the 746 million penalty against Amazon. So uh, yep. Uh, and you know, there have also been other fines, 225 million for WhatsApp, 17 million for Facebook, um, and because they're violating children's privacies, including publication of kids' emails, addresses, and phone numbers. Uh, so yeah, when I, you know, I, I know that I care about like users and ethics, but also like if you are not acting in the best users of, uh, best interest of their users, um, and you know, legislation changes uh, or even you know under current legislation you are you know violating people's rights um they are likely to make you pay for it so uh yeah just something to think about in your in your work <sighs> and then so we talked about this last week um fog reveal is actually uh based here in in richmond in virginia which is where i live um sorry i A big part of my heart is here and, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the people I live best in the world live here and I have, you know, a great, great love and respect for this place and her people, but sometimes, goddamn, <laughs> you know that song, Mississippi Goddamn? <sighs> sometimes. Anyway, um, well, I'm upset because I care and I know, I know we can do better. Uh, not interested in hearing a bunch of people slagging off on the South, uh, please don't bother. Uh, yeah, so this is basically a tool that lets police get detailed information on individuals' movements by just paying for it, uh, which is, of course, a direct violation of the Fourth Amendment right uh, against unreasonable search and seizure. So, uh, and this is a uh, um, user manual for the tool uh, and like how easy it is to use and how much information is in it, uh, right? Uh, also, if you have any tips for uh, for this reporting team, uh, feel free to write out. Uh, write out. Uh, Mind Gaming says, <clears throat> "Excuse me, where do all the fine money go?" I don't know. Um, so I know that in the United States, if a fine is levied by a local jurisdiction, it um, is usually kept within that jurisdiction, right? So, like, if you get fined by um, a city, the city keeps that money, and then it goes into their like their budget, right? Um, 
in a lot of places if the police like you pay for a parking ticket or something that goes directly to the police department and is uh, used to buy like um goodies for the police officers which means that they are directly incentivized to provide more parking tickets and speeding fines etc which is not great um but i don't know how it works in the eu but generally in the united states if you are fined by a um government level of government that money goes into the budget for that level of government and is spent along with the other money so like um at a state level in the u.s it might be like teaching salaries uh highway maintenance um uh, subsidies for solar that's a big thing that's coming up because of the uh inflation reduction act so things like that yeah <laughs> robbie says the money goes to me and nice work if you can get it uh yep uh, anyway, so here's the sort of uh, thing that they can do, right? They can be like, hey, who was in uh, the parking lot of the LA Fitness at, you know, 9 a.m. on Monday morning? And here's the thing about geofencing warrants. So if you're not sort of familiar with, I understand how, if you haven't really thought about it or are not sort of familiar with, you know, the protections that should be afforded under the US Constitution, you might be like, oh, this is fine. They want to get like all the suspects that were in this place, right? Um, so first of all, <laughs> um, this is, I would say, an unreasonable search and seizure. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but right, like knowing everyone who was in a place at a time based on their cell phone data is very much um, an invasion of privacy. Um, and even if this, I think there's also a big assumption that tools that are made available to police are only going to be used to, you know, do, uh, let's say crime fighting. Um, but the unfortunate matter of it is that um, they are almost unilaterally, based on the reporting that I have read, uh, abused. And um, in particular, <clears throat> excuse me, used to target private citizens um, that maybe uh, that person has a grudge against. Um, also, a very large proportion of uh, police officers are often, are also domestic abusers. There's been a lot of research on this. Again, this is in the United States. I'm not as familiar with other places. Um, and these are like, this is stalker shit, right? This is a, a clear way that you can uh, exert control over individuals. Um, what protections are there against that, right? Like setting aside the Fourth Amendment, which I don't intend to do <laughs> as a citizen. Um, Right, like what protections are there against individuals for malicious individuals who have access to the system to be used against it? Great question. Um, yep, anyway, not great. <laughs> not great. Uh, and again, usually uh, police would need to do something like have a warrant for this information, but since this is just a, a thing that you can pay money for, now they can just buy it. Yay. Yeah, uh, Cognition says it's an unsettled legal glory area, isn't it? Uh, I agree, by the way, I'm not trying to downplay, I'm just curious. Yeah, I think, like, I don't think there is clear case law that they can't do this. Um, I sure hope they stop, <laughs> right? And, like, uh, it is very frustrating. Um, yeah, so, like, in Virginia, we had a state-level law that was passed to... Uh, uh, ban the use of facial recognition technology by state law enforcement agencies that was uh, repealed basically um, this year, which god dang, <laughs> Virginia, god damn. Um, and who knows, maybe we'll get it back in the future and uh, we'll continue to enjoy privacy as a thing that exists. But yeah. Uh, and also something that I would love legislation around. Uh, yeah. Also, just sort of interesting uh, legislation from elsewhere in the U.S. I, elsewhere in the world. I'm trying not to be too U.S. focused. Um, yeah, Kanishin says that's what I thought. That's the part that concerns me, actually. Yeah. I mean, also, you know. I think that, I mean, if if you aren't sort of really reading up on, on criminal justice and, and sort of that sort of thing, um, it was very hedgy, but <laughs> in the US, it's very easy to form a false impression of what the police are and what they do from like TV shows. Um, and I think, you know, at one point that was me, right? Like I had no idea what was going on, right? Like I 
like when I was a kid, right? My parents told me, you know, the police will always protect you. You can always trust the police. Um, a, you cannot trust the police. <laughs> if, if you are interacting with a, a police officer in the United States, say as little as possible and get a lawyer. Um, they, they don't have your best interests at heart. And also they have no duty to protect you legally. Um, they, they don't need to, right? Which is why the thing with the, all those kids being killed in a school shooting and the police just doing nothing is perfectly legal and fine, right? They don't have any duty to protect you. Um, um, which I, I think is an unpleasant shock <laughs> to a lot of people when they first discover it. Um, yep. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm also hopeful about that cognition so that the case law may still end up shaking out in favor of allowing this. Oh, sorry, I'm hopeful that it doesn't. Um, and it really just, it depends on, you know, what judges think basically, because this is probably not gonna be decided by a jury. Anyway. Um, yeah, so uh, Beijing has just introduced legislation to set uh, standards for digital assistants, virtual influencers, and gaming avatars, uh, right? So I don't recognize this person. I don't think that's Hukuni Mitsu, who is the only one I recognize. Um, but yes, so uh, very interesting legislation to try and like lead the direction of, of technology. Um, Blah, 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 blah. Uh, in the plan, Beijing government does not outright define what counts as a digital human, uh, but digital. But analysts say the term covers anything from player-controlled avatars in games like Roblox uh, to virtual influencers and digital pop stars. One sec, let me get some water. Losing my voice. <laughs> uh, and basically, there's now like rules about stuff, right? Um, so ba -ba -ba -ba. i'm just trying to think things about it um the government has really concrete ideas on how to lead this industry to the point of where they want it to be they're trying to centralize as well as isolate the chinese metaverse or digital ecosystem from that abroad uh yep yeah, will be required to turn that tie their online personas to their real life identification documents so not being able to have like anonymity through a um thing to do avatar digital avatar Anyway, uh, just interesting. I don't. I think that at this point, it's just like we're gonna do it, uh, and not like here's the specific regulations, but something to keep an eye on. All right, next up. Um, this is interesting. I don't agree. <laughs> uh, so uh, there's this think piece uh, based on the um, the nonpartisan think tank Bookings uh, published a piece decrying the block's regulation of open source AI, uh, arguing that it would create legal liability for general purpose AI systems while simultaneously undermining their development. Uh, this is one of those things where like, you may be on the hook if you build something that is harmful. I feel like it's not, not an issue. Again, like imagine like auto manufacturing, right? And people who are doing engineering in that setting, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're liable if you build the exploding car 3000 that explodes and kills people. Like, I, it does not strike me as weird that this is something that should happen. Um, and like, yeah, it may have a chilling effect, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, definitely. Under these rules, I think people would be less likely to do things like GPT 4chan, right? Because they'd be liable. Um, or, you know, their, their companies would be liable if they're working in a commercial setting, so. Um, anyway, but they're sort of being like, hey, you know, this could be an issue. Uh, it could be mostly be like companies that do it. Uh, the legislation carves out some categories for open source AI, like those exclusively used for research and with controls to prevent misuse. Uh, but it'd be difficult, if not impossible, to prevent these projects from making their way into commercial systems where they could be then abused by malicious actors. Um, yep. <laughs> Uh, Stable Diffusion, great example, an open source AI system that generates images from text prompts was released with a license since prohibiting certain types of content, rail, um, sorry, responsible use, responsible AI license, I think is the, the name of the license, uh, but it quickly found an audience within communities to use such AI tools to create pornographic deepfakes of celebrities. Who could have thought this would have happened? Literally everyone working in the ethics research. You didn't have to open source it. No one made you do it. You chose to do it. Why did you do that? Did you think about the malicious uses? You were like, yes, I'm going to cover my butt by having a license. Okay, well, the license has been violated. Now what? Now what? <sighs> anyway, also, um, speaking of problematic, <laughs> Sorry, this is my personal baggage. I've had some extremely frustrating conversations with Oren about ethics and <laughs> what his beliefs are. Um, 
Also, uh, the last time I talked to him, what he said the single most pressing ethical problem was, was developing self-driving cars because it would reduce traffic fatalities. Um, I don't think he's working on that anymore, so clearly he changed his mind. Um, and, uh, yep. Anyway, interesting. That's just me being salty because of my personal history with this person. Um, know that I have a bias there. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Yeah. We're responsible for what we do. Uh... Oh, you can't see that really quick. Uh, it says the EU's AI Act could have a chilling effect on open source efforts export. Experts warn. Yeah. Yeah. You're responsible for what you do and what you build, and you have some moral culpability for it, even if you don't have legal culpability. Think about the effects of your actions. Anyway. I feel like a, you know, classic old man shaking stick at cloud. All right, next up, ethics. Uh, so first up, we have uh, a Twitter thread with some papers, and I think what really, what really stuck out to me about this thread was what people are working on. Um, so you may think that the AI ML safety research is about, you know, um, protecting individuals from deployed systems generally, and that is right, but usually it's talking about alignment, which is like, once we hit the singularity, how can we make sure that robots share our ethics and not like, hey, how can we stop deciding who gets benefits in the UK in an automated way that people can't um, appeal? We'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, anyway, so OpenAI has an alignment science. Um, GPT-3 reduces uh, social psychology results. Uh, uh, obeying harmful orders, even when the human is likely to be hurt. Cool, love to see that. Um, DeepMind paper proposes a structured chain of thought method to ensure forward reasoning steps are correct and to avoid hallucinated facts. Um, reasoning does not uh, ensure accuracy or factuality. Um, mechanistic interpretability for grokking. Oh, so uh, grokking is the thing where if you keep training a, um, so you know, usually like you're training a model, your arrow goes down, your arrow goes down, so your arrow go down, and you hit the elbow and it sort of levels out. Grokking is if you keep going for a ridiculously long amount of time, sometimes, and we don't have a clear idea of when or why, you suddenly get a second descent, right? So sometimes people will call it double descent. Um, uh, Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. If you are trying to get it to work and it doesn't work, you've just wasted an enormous amount of resources. I don't generally recommend trying to find, trying to make grokking work when you're working on a system because that's just expensive. But, um, but uh, yes, here's a potential uh, interpretability for uh, this mechanism. Um, Yep, and then steganography is uh, something I'm not super familiar with, but uh, originally comes from computer security or refers to the practice of hiding messages or data in otherwise innocent looking media such as images, audio, and text. The goal is to avoid detection by an adversary who might intercept or inspect the media and to communicate covertly with a trusted receiver who knows how to decode the hidden information. Uh, chain of thought reasoning is this like, first I do X, second I do Y. So what this paper was working on, also, I have, it has not uh, escaped my notice that most of these are preprints. Oh, wow, I am saucy today. <laughs> Sorry, I, I guess I'm just frustrated about stuff. Um, and the sort of like claim here is the like, well, maybe actually what you're doing is the machine is doing what it's doing for other reasons. And what you think that you are seeing in this chain of thought is not actually there. Um, Externalizing reasoning, uh, forcing it to think out loud, verify that reasoning is causally responsible for the output, and then just make sure the reasoning is safe. Uh, and then the technical alignment survey, uh, an overview of the technical alignment landscape, uh, a detailed overview of what conjecture works on. So here's sort of the, uh, the, uh, the sort of a general idea. Um, so if you're interested in sort of reading up on, on what people are working on currently, Here's a smorgasbord of publication by a uh, press release uh, and also some actual papers, it looks like, um, that are relevant. And I'll pop this in the chat. This is one of those things where, like, cool. <laughs> this is such an avoidable problem is to just do a different thing uh, and not do a really big model that needs alignment, right? Like, in style, build a small purpose built system. But I don't know. Again, that's my bias. All right, 
Uh, and then <laughs> speaking of things that I think are more, more pressing problems, um, so uh, this is from Technicality, who we talk about quite a bit on the channel, and she is Global Privacy Counsel at Epic Privacy, so a, a lawyer, actually a lawyer, unlike me, who's nowhere close to even being a lawyer. Um, and uh, this point in this thread really stuck out to me, uh, but the, the idea is this is a response to something that you you'll hear when you're talking about privacy, which is like, well, if this thing is invading your privacy and you don't want your privacy invaded, just don't use this thing, which would be fine if there weren't so many things invading our privacy that are used to gatekeep other stuff, right? Like Proctor.io doesn't work, does not detect cheating, but it can require that students scan their bedrooms and send that image to like strangers to review, right? Clear invasion of privacy, right? If I have, you know, a queer pride flag on my wall, Great, I've just outed myself to a stranger. <laughs> I am in this uh, example. I'm probably a child because this is for students. <sighs> um. Anyway, and the, the point that she's making here is the whole argument boils down to if you don't like the tracking, don't use any of these services. How does one have a job, pay bills, and exist in the world without using any of these things, right? Like um, email tracking. How are you going to avoid that and also be able to submit your resume places? Um, anyway, uh, and the uh, so Cash Hill did a, a series of articles years ago trying not to use any of the services or be tracked by different tech companies. It was either impossible or possible only if she did not do her job or interact with the world, um, right? And I believe that was before, you know, the thing that made us all remote. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway. Uh, I'm the person who tries to minimize the amount of tech I use. I have very minimal apps on my phone. I try to use the most privacy protective options, etc. Sometimes there are not good options. Like if she wants to go to a concert, she has to trade privacy for that, right? Um, how do I do my job without electronic devices? The internet, right? So we are we are forcing people to accept invasions of their privacy um, in order to exist in modern society. Uh, and these are these are technical choices that engineers are making that affect individuals um, that they don't get a chance to opt out of. Anyway, yeah, uh, I think this is very well articulated and also a problem that I have with a lot of sort of reactions to people talking about privacy. Speaking of, new biometrics just dropped. Yay. Um, you may or may not know how I feel about biometrics, but I hate them. <laughs> not a big fan. Um, a, you know, uh, there's the privacy problems uh, because they are tied to you as an individual in a body. Uh, and B, if they're hacked and spoofed, you can't do anything about it without changing your body. And that is, again, an unreasonable expectation to have of users. Um, so yeah, just a, a new way to detect people. Um, there was also one recently with like using smartphone sensors to detect like heart rates <laughs> and using that for biometrics, uh, footfalls, etc. So, yep. Um, also, so this is the ethics section. That's probably why I'm so salty. Um, uh, so this uh, is from Chansey Fleet, uh, who is blind and works in tech, um, non-visual tech education and define at uh, NYPL. I don't know how to say that. It's a place um, in New York, I must assume. Uh, and uh, she... Uh, Chansey is reacting to uh, this news, which is that 1Password's uh, newest update uh, is completely inaccessible for blind users. So a lot of folks who are blind will use screen readers, which actually go through and, and read all the text on the screen. Um, and uh, if you are using a screen reader on iOS and you have updated to iPassword1, which is a, a password manager, um, you can't read usernames or password fields, which doesn't work. You need those to enter your passwords, right? Um, so that's a big issue. Um, and uh, Chansey had some concrete steps that uh, are for, for people working in tech about how to avoid things like this with their products, which I mean, obviously horrible PR, but also just like you've you ruined somebody's life, right? You've locked them out of their email permanently <laughs> because they can't get their 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 password entered to to enter their password and get their email. Um, 
adding some masks here. Advocate for routine accessibility testing by fluent users during the dev process. So this would be like someone who is good at using a screen reader, which is a very learned skill. Um, breaks on shipping updates that block access, right? So uh, don't, don't ship it if it means that, you know, your disabled users aren't going to be able to use it. That should be a blocker. Uh, support blind friends and colleagues by helping them learn to turn off auto updates and check reliable sources before updating. Um, so this is sort of like for people in the world. Um, if you're part of a procurement flow, you have the awesome power to mandate access and build in meaningful consequences for access breaches. No, I will not call them bugs. They're as disruptive and critical as security breaches, so let's not downplay them, which I think is a great, uh, uh, great point. We can also advocate with the legislature, local on top and in the press. So that means local legislatures first. Uh, consistent, equitable digital accessibility is within reach using standards well known to competent developers and we deserve nothing less. Here, here. So uh, just some things to keep in mind. And then this. So this is from uh, this piece in Logic Magazine by Dan McQuillan, who has a book that we've been we've talked about a couple times on the channel um, that is, I don't believe, out just yet, but will be out very soon, uh, Resisting AI, an Anti-Fascist Approach to Artificial Intelligence. So this is a um, adapted excerpt from this. Um, and it's a little bit of a harrowing read. I'll pop it in the chat if you'd like to uh, like to read it. Um, and it is a little bit UK focused. Um, and basically the um, the overall point here is that deep learning is putting a, a mask almost, um, making it easier and more possible to um, uh, consign people to death <laughs> in the worst case scenario. So one of the things that was brought up was, um, you know, a lot during, you know, the, the first wave of COVID-19, a lot of disabled folks were against their will or knowledge put on do not resuscitate orders, right? So um, basically just allowed to die <laughs> if they coded. Um, and again, they didn't ask for this. This was a decision that was made for them. Um, and uh, very ableist, right? This little section here is about ableism, which is discrimination against disabled folks. And if you're like, I don't know any disabled folks, you do, I'm disabled. <laughs> uh, and also I think something like three quarters of people are going to become disabled <laughs> within the next 10 years, just like looking at, and the, the numbers are off on that, I'm almost certain. I'm almost certain, but most people will in their lives become disabled, right? Um, as you age through injury, through a temporary or permanent condition, right? access and um, rejecting ableism is important for all of us. <laughs> Even if you're only just being self-centered, you will probably be disabled at some point. Um, so, you know, making accessibility important is making your own life easier in the future. Uh, in addition to just like, you know, creating a society that we want to live in. Um, anyway, so the, the sort of the whole premise here is like, if you are moving to automated decision making or the UK in particular has been moving to automated decision making for things like, do you get access to benefits, right? You know, if you can't work, do you get food? <laughs> um, and who gets those? And you know, okay, oh, well, we're all out of money. So we need to remove some people's benefits whose benefits are removed. Um, how is that decision made? Um, and this particular expert that, uh, I clicked out of do, 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 do. Uh, this particular expert, which was uh, selected by Khadija um, up from the cracks, um, is uh, I think, you know, uh, the shift to algorithmic ordering doesn't simply automate the system, but alters it without any democratic debate, right? Like decisions are now being made in an automatic way that people can't, you know, disagree with. As the UN Special Rapporteur, reporter, rapporteur, on extreme poverty and human rights has reported, so-called digital transformation and the shift to algorithmic governance conceals myriad structural changes to the social contract. The digital upgrade of the state means a downgraded safety net for the rest of us. Um, yep, so uh, an issue, right? And the, the people who are going to be bearing the biggest brunt of this are going to be, you know, uh, the people who are most vulnerable. So anyway, very chilling read. Um, don't read it right before bed. <laughs> you may have a hard time sleeping. 
All right, next up, Oy. so this is from, uh, this is also an excerpt uh, from this uh, piece from Rest of the World, one of our, my, maybe yours as well, uh, one of my favorite uh, news outlets. So it's tech news from places that aren't <laughs> uh, Europe or the US. Um, and uh, in this particular one, it was uh, a, <laughs> God, this sounds like such a nightmarish 2020 headline, but a Minecraft crypto empire that all came crashing down. So basically it was like this NFT crypto um, thing. Um, and wow, the grift didn't work out for people. Um, and yes, so this was uh, going on and you know, all this sort of discussion, but the, like this is what, um, cause I sort of like, skimmed it before and then uh, seeing this particular pop out was like, ee! Um, so this person who, who was involved with this project said, uh, with a cheap labor of developing countries, uh, um, cool way to devalue human life, my dude. Uh, you could use people in the Philippines as NPCs, non-playable characters, real life NPCs in your games. They could just populate the world, maybe do a random job or just walk back and forth, fishing, telling stories, a shopkeeper, anything is really possible, right? So this is like, using humans to do menial work as like set dressing for digital spaces and to be fair i don't think that like you know a digital interactive dinner theater sort of experience is um bad right like i think that could be a lot of fun i think that like as a concept, you know, you're in a video game or some of the other video game characters are being played by like actors, right? And they're paid for that job. Um, I don't think that's necessarily inherently an issue, uh, but this thing where like the reason that that's possible is because of labor exploitation and you are underpaying people to act as like props <laughs> is wild. Um, it reminds me of that like very famous motif of like um, slaves fanning a rich person, right? Like for the momentary enjoyment of the person in a position of power, uh, and they're usually children in the in the motifs as well. Um, you are exploiting the labor of vulnerable individuals, and I, again, I'm not saying that this shouldn't be a thing, but like uh pay people <laughs> pay people stop being a cheap grifter um anyway fun <laughs> on that note oh also something that is wild sorry just a little bit of a tangent so um the minimum wage here in Virginia for this year is raising for the very first time, or I think it was in 2020, raised for the very first time since I worked minimum wage jobs many years ago. <laughs> um, yeah, speaking of underpaying people, I'm just gonna get you some numbers because uh, I think it would be helpful. Uh, I believe it's being slowly incrementally adjusted to $12 an hour and it was $7.25 um, when I was working minimum wage jobs because that was the federal minimum wage and it was still the minimum wage in Richmond uh, up until very, very, very recently. Or Virginia, it's a state level thing, not a, not a local level thing. Yeah, right, search is being slow, moving on. Uh, <laughs> So I thought this was just sort of funny. Uh, so this is um, a website. This person is looking at it mobile. You know, the screen's been shifted, uh, but these German words are so dang long. <laughs> they're just running off the screen. Um, I just thought it was funny. Um, I think it's a, a very tired joke that German words are long, but boy, howdy are they. So, yep. Uh, Another thing I thought was really interesting was uh, this sort of data visualization. I think this is a beautiful data visualization. I love it. Um, so in the United States, it is common for houses to have like a little strip of grass out front uh, and for it to be mowed and like only one type of grass in it is sort of like the ideal. Um, I strongly disapprove of lawns. They are horrible for the environment. Um, but this sort of analysis is like, okay, what if you only mow your lawn one or two times a year as opposed to multiple times a week? Um, well, what you get is a lot of sort of insect, especially pollinator, um, coming back. 
Um, but it doesn't uh, improve the uh, the habitat for pest species, right? So uh, if you if you only mow your lawn uh, once or two times a year, you'll get lots of helpful bugs, and you are not going to get any more pest species. So here's the the data visualization. Um, that it's a little bit off, but the top says effects of reduced mowing on arthropod abundance. Uh, and overall, it's improved a little bit. You get a lot more winged insects. Um, you get fewer pests, which is interesting. So the gray here are the error bars. Um, you get more non pests. You get uh, fewer ground dwelling insects and more above ground dwelling insects. Uh, and it also looks to be uh, slightly better in Europe. So or the, the effective improvement tends to be slightly better in Europe. So yeah, just a really beautiful, interesting uh, data visualization, cool study. Don't mow your lawn. Uh, Cognition says monoculture is bad. Yeah, uh, I am. Okay, not to be. <laughs> uh, so I've mentioned a couple times that I, uh, I lived on a farm in high school and I um, also in college, I was, uh, uh, helped run a uh, nonprofit uh, co-op that helps local farmers distribute um, vegetables uh, on campus at, at William and Mary. It's called Real Food. I actually don't know if it's still around. I should look it up and see if see if folks are still doing it. Um, and one of my big projects was uh, helping us accept uh, EBT and SNAP benefits, which are like food uh, food stamps, um, which was a whole big thing. It's so much paperwork. Anyway. Um, and I am personally, in terms of like yard design, a big fan of uh, permaculture designs, which is basically uh, focused around food producing plants and particularly annual food producing plants. You don't really need to do much. And it's just sort of like, here's a bunch of natives you can eat. Yeah. <laughs> Dana says, if only the homeowners association read this paper, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, Homeowners associations are, for those of you who are not from the US, a blight on society. Uh, and basically it says that if you belong to one and you own a house, uh, the homeowners association can be like, you can and can't do this with your house. You can only paint it these colors. You can only do this with your lawn. Um, yeah, uh, they are uh, not the best. All right, and then this, uh, uh, this is just fascinating. So this is a question that Dwayne asked because one of his students asked it uh, in, uh, in class. Um, and the question is, how many distinctive phonemes are out there? Uh, and this is just sort of a very, uh, a very sort of funny question to ask if you are a linguist. Um, <laughs> and at first I thought he was trolling. I'm just trying to get like a bunch of reactions from people. Um, but a distinctive phoneme is basically if there are two words that vary by one language sound, that language sound is distinctive, right? So in English, we have pat and bat, which are both, um, pat is also aspirated. So oof, I know there's some Hindi speakers in this. I'm gonna try and do an unaspirated stop, stop as well. So bat, the English b, pat, the English p, and then bat, the non-aspirated p, right? So for an English speaker, um, bat may sound a little bit like pat and a little bit like bat, but it's clearly not either. Um, so in English, it's not a, like pat, bat, and bat are not three different words. It's two words and one thing that's a little bit weird. Whereas uh, in a language like Hindi, where you have that distinction, that would be three different words. So those are distinctive phonemes, three distinctive phonemes in English and two distinctive phonemes, sorry, three different distinctive phonemes in Hindi and two distinctive phonemes in English. Right. Um, so how many of those sounds are there? It's sort of like an unanswerable question because it is language specific. Um, and this, this may make you um, unhappy to learn this, but there's nothing invariant in language, right? So even though, you know, you can, um, if I say like a la, a la, a la, like a l a, that middle l sound, I realized as I was saying it that that is a word in uh, phonetics when you are um, producing a sound, you usually do ah, uh, ah, uh, um, just because it's a very neutral uh, vowel, you're not doing a lot with your tongue. Anyway, um, 
those three L's, even though that sounded like I said the same thing three times, if you look at the acoustics and even the production, they're all slightly different from each other. Um, so a phoneme in a language is a collection of things that are sort of similar to each other, and it is a useful term for describing that uh, distribution. Whether or not it's really a real thing is dependent on your linguistic stance. But anyway, um, it's just a very interesting distinction, and you can see there's a lot of sort of like joke answers for it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, this person, uh, is using the, uh, international phonetic alphabet as a proxy for distinctive phonemes, which I think is, uh, interesting choice. Uh, probably, I think it's not an unreasonable proxy, but I mean, that's what is a pa in English, right? Sorry, a pa in English. Uh, can I ask for a middle word? A pa, a pa, a ba, right? So what is the, the aspirated, uh, intervocalic? Uh, bilabial and voice stop in English. What is that? Is it still a phoneme in English? It's not, right? But you can say it. Anyway, uh, Lauren gave the technically correct answer of at least three, which I would definitely agree with. Um, yeah, and then folks being like, it's impossible to enumerate this. What's a phoneme? Um, whenever you pull out a, a you know, construct in linguistics, someone's going to disagree about it existing. <laughs> this is a strict question. Um, Anyway, so lots of uh, Ember says yes. Uh, lots of fun answers to this this interesting question. So, anyway, if you like linguistics, uh, I think this is a, a cool thing. Uh, oh, this person's looking at Foible, which um, was a data set put together by one of my advisee siblings, so somebody else who had the same advisor as me. I think I think Stephen Mayhew worked on, on Foible. Uh, but a lot of them are only attested in one language, so. Uh, yeah, anyway, unanswerable question, but sort of fun to think about is how I would uh, read that. And if you're interested in just listening in on the nerds, <laughs> uh, it's, like, uh, it's like tapping the glass in the aquarium. What you doing? It's me. I'm also this type of nerd. All right. And then finally, also on linguistics, uh, this person uh, made some uh, some fun uh, memes. <laughs> uh, sorry, some fun uh, Pokemon. I guess it is also a meme uh, for linguistics, right? So um, this uh, the first Wug Wugs thing is from a very famous study by Joan Burko Gleason about the productivity of morphology, um, and particularly for children. Um, Esperanto is a constructed languages. I don't actually know what this sort of like happy face represents, but I'm guessing it's something EU centric based on the colors. Um, <laughs> uh, Sapir Whorf, uh, so Sapir and Whorf are two anthropologists, and the Sapir Whorf hypothesis is that the language that you speak affects your cognition, um, right? So, an example of this is um, in some languages, directional systems are uh, in relation to the cardinal directions, and in some languages, directional systems are relational to you. So, in English, often people will talk about right and left when giving directions as opposed to north and south. Um, however, in Hawaiian, uh, directions are often given uh, in sort of like a to the beach, away from the beach sort of uh, way, which is in relation to the landscape and not to the person. A lot of Papuan New Guinean languages um, are, are sort of similar. Uh, and then the strong Sapir Hyworth hypothesis is like a super strong version of that. Um, uh, recursion, I'm assuming y'all know what recursion is, it's a thing. Um, and then the evolved form of recursion is just still recursion because it's it's an infinitely repeatable process. Um, this one at the bottom, uh, Boba and Kiki uh, are two, um, Boba is sort of like rounded and Kiki is pointed and it's about the uh, iconicity of language sounds. So most people will associate the name Boba with the rounded shape and Kiki with the pointed shape. Um, so if you see a discussion about that, that's it. Uh, and then Duo Trio is just like a fun morphology pun. Uh, also, obviously, from a language learning app. Anyway, I thought it was fun. If I was teaching linguistics this semester, I'd uh, I'd bring that up. Uh, but that is all I have for you today. We got through it all in a mere two hours. Uh, so before we wrap up, I want to say thank you very much to all of my supporters. Um, also, if you are a uh, a monthly supporter of me on Coffee, you get. Um, Every week I, I upload all of the links that we talked about with some extra annotation. Um, so those are all, they've also already been published today. So they're already up on, on coffee. would like to check it out. And it's, uh, my coffee is that one. Uh, 
co-fi.com slash r-c-t-a-t-m-a-n i'm that everywhere um and these are my wonderful beautiful monthly supporters who help make this possible i appreciate you all very very much um and um, i also very much appreciate my my one-off supporters so if you've been a one-off supporter thank you i appreciate that or you could buy my book <laughs> uh, so i wrote a book uh, the nine most common uh, language technology mistakes it's also on coffee um if you're interested uh, but yeah, thank you. Thank you to all my supporters. And thank you to all you for watching. I really appreciate it. Great to chat. Uh, ah, hi, Docking. Uh, oh, thank you. I really like hearing your insights from being inside the field. Oh, I appreciate that. Uh, Robbie says, do you think linguists can build the best language tech? I mean, I think language technologists can build the best language technology and knowing about language is helpful. So I think knowing about linguistics is good. I don't think you necessarily need to get a PhD in linguistics to build language technology. And in fact, I would say that's maybe not the best use of your time. Yeah. Bio player. Uh, thank you, Sue. Thank you all so much for joining i hope you have a great week and we'll be back on tuesday where i'm planning on so if you saw on twitter uh i'm running like a little informal survey about um sort of how people assign agency and sort of like internal self to language technology systems and if there's sort of general patterns in behavior uh, and also if that's reflect if that's uh uh if it is related to whether or not you've studied uh, human cognition and, and humans as, um, as a study, research study. So anyway, the survey is on my Twitter if you'd like to go see it. And my Twitter is R-C-T-A-T-M-A-N. Um, yeah, but that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate you all. And I will talk to you soon. Bye.